In today's gospel reading, our Lord is warning his disciples, his followers, to beware of these scribes who love to be treated with great honor and respect. And he points out how they do things to gain this honor and respect. But notice he also mentions they devour widows' houses. In other words, they're very selfish, full of pride. They're avaricious or greedy. They just want wealth. They want status. They want position. Very self-centered, not caring about others, even widows, taking advantage of them, and in the end, taking all they have, even their homes. So devouring widows' houses. And our Lord contrasts these individuals with this poor widow who puts in two small copper coins worth only a penny, which in reality is like nothing. I mean, think even for us, what's a penny today? We've stopped the circulation of pennies because they're just, the value is so, so small. In like manner, even a penny at that time was, was just a very small amount, but it was all that she had to live on. Maybe she could have bought food, but she's giving this money to the treasury in the temple. In other words, for the things of God. Now, some people might assume that, you know, the message here is to be generous with supporting the church or supporting the kingdom of God. And yeah, it's kind of like that, but there's a lot more to it. So yes, people should be generous. You know, when, when people give, it shouldn't just be, you know, a, a list of things and, oh yeah, the church is one of those things. But the ideal is that people are generous. Some people say, oh, we should give when it comes to charity until it hurts. But our Lord isn't really focused on that. He says that she has given more than all the others. Now, if we look at it from the human perspective, all the others gave more, but they gave from their abundance. In other words, it's easy to give from the money that you have to spare. It's easy to give from that. Even if you were to give 10%, if it's money you can spare, it's not a big deal. But yes, when it's, when it's a real sacrifice, when it's going to cut into your, your, uh, you know, your plans for, for spending your money, it's going to be difficult. But in her case, our Lord is not looking at the, the monetary value of how much she gave, but rather the sacrifice she makes in giving so in other words, she's giving all that she has. Now, it seems that she, she doesn't even have a home. How is she going to survive? We don't know. But the point is that by giving everything that she has and putting God first instead of herself, she's basically entrusting herself to God, to God's providence. In other words, she's making this sacrifice for God and Kind of the attitude, okay, God, you have to take care of me. You have to provide for me. I may have to beg. I may have to live out in the streets. I don't know. But no matter what, she's putting her trust in God. Now, we saw in today's first reading from the book of Kings, the prophet Elijah, he encounters this widow with her son, and they just have a small amount of meal left in a jar and some oil. And Elijah asks her to, to make some for her. And she says, oh, I was just going to prepare it for my son and I, and then we were going to die. In other words, this is all we have. And there's a famine taking place, so nobody has any food. Everybody's starving. This is all they have left. But she's called to make a sacrifice for the prophet of God. In other words, for the things of God. And she's willing to do that, but God, through Elijah, works a miracle, and her, her uh, meal in the jar and, and her oil, it doesn't d d diminish. In other words, God miraculously replaces it. So they're able to survive for a very long period of time, feeding Elijah, the widow, and her son. And it just, okay, that's not going to happen every time, granted. But it's just an example of how God takes care of those who put their trust in God, first and foremost. Now, a lot of people think, oh, when we say that, or, or when I say that, it means that everything will go well. Uh-uh. That's not what it means. It means that God will give us what we need. 
and especially the spiritual graces that we need to face whatever difficulty, whatever challenges we may be facing. It's not to say that we won't have difficulties. It's not to say that we won't have challenges. We might even be starving. We may have lost our job. We may not be able to pay our bills. We too may be kicked out of our homes. We may be persecuted. We may even be martyred for our faith. But the point is that we have to trust God no matter what happens. And very often when bad things happen to us, we sometimes think, oh, God is punishing us. And we kind of point an accusatory finger at God. Why would God allow this to happen to me? And there are many people who, I mentioned this before, who stop practicing their faith. They get angry with God. Oh, I was a good Catholic. I went to church every Sunday. I said my prayers, never did anything bad. Why would this bad thing happen to me or to my loved ones? And they get angry with God. And I try to explain to them that when we have that attitude, when we have that attitude, we're not really worshiping God or believing in God or trusting in God. We're making ourselves to be God. And we're making God to be our servant. And we're saying, God, you're a bad boy because you didn't fix my problem. Therefore, I'm angry with you, so I'm going to reject you from my life. Not a good attitude. God never promised us happiness here on earth. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Now, it is true that if we put God first, yes, God will bless us. It is true that the more we sacrifice for God, the more good that we will receive. So God loves a cheerful giver. And there's a saying that God doesn't allow himself to be outdone in charity. The more we do for God, the more God will do for us. But that's no guarantee that we won't suffer or get sick or even die. Think of these people, these individuals who contract the coronavirus and are in hospitals and they're totally isolated. They're all alone. Their own family members cannot visit them, and they may be dying. What is their attitude as they lay on their hospital bed and have no hope for the future? Are they angry with God? Or do they trust in God no matter what, which is what God wants us to do? In other words, God wants to help them at that moment. But if they don't have the right attitude towards God, it's kind of like God is prevented from helping them. Now, it's not to say that God is going to work a miracle. He could. And in some cases, he may have done so already. But the point is, if they are dying, they especially need God's graces. They need God's blessings. They need God's presence in their life. And they need to trust God because they have to entrust their life to him because they may be dying and one day, that could be you and I. It may not be from the coronavirus. It could be from anything. We have to trust God, and we have to entrust our lives to him completely. And this is what the widow in today's gospel reading did. And God, our Lord, was aware of that. God sees the sacrifices that we make for him. And God will reward us for every sacrifice that we make. You know, Holy Mother Church, various popes, many saints encourage us to consecrate our lives entirely to God. You know, God is not asking all of us or all of you to give everything you possess to the church or for the kingdom of God. God is not asking that of you. But he is asking you to entrust your life to him. Now, it is true that God does ask that from some people to give everything. So people who, who respond by saying yes to a religious vocation, in other words, to become um, like, like a monk or, or a nun, a religious sister or a religious brother, they take vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity. And usually it's young people who respond to this call, but sometimes it's people who are a little bit older. They may have very good jobs. They may have a home, they may have a fancy car, they may have all kinds of possessions, they may have money in the bank, but they renounce all of those things in order to enter religious life. And they embrace a life of poverty and obedience. 
In other words, they're not going to follow their own will, their own selfish desires. They're going to obey their religious superior. And in doing this, they're really consecrating themselves, dedicating their life to the service of God. And they trust that God will take care of them. You and I, we are not called to enter religious life. You know, as, as diocesan priests, we're allowed to have possessions. We don't take a vow of poverty the way that, that the religious do. But God nevertheless wants us to consecrate ourselves to him, to entrust everything that we have, including our possessions, including our loved ones. It's kind of like putting money in a bank. Wouldn't you want to put your money in the bank that's going to give the best interest? Well, of course you would. And so it is with God. If we entrust our lives to our own selves, our own intellect, thinking that we know what's best for us, well, we're not going to get much back. But if we entrust ourselves completely to God, then God will give us the graces that we need to, to enable us to prosper, but also during times of difficulty, during times of great distress, great trial, perhaps even when we may be on our deathbed. And so I encourage you to listen to the advice of the popes, the church, various saints who encourage us to consecrate ourselves, consecrate our lives completely to God. Entrust your lives completely to God. Trust in his love for you.